Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff I Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. So Annie, I already know this. God. What is your favorite spy character to dress up as? <laughs> spy character to dress up as? I feel like you already have, right? Oh, yeah. Well, it's a winter soldier. Okay. I, I, I thought so. <laughs> I thought so. I knew you had that. Yes, yes. But I do have um, Black Widow. And I also have... Uh, Catwoman, which I'm not sure counts as a spy. She's, she's not kind a of spy. in that arena. She's a cat burglar. She's a cat burglar. Excuse me. Uh, she's a cat burglar that ended up being like trying to be an assassin later, but she's technically a cat burglar. I like how you emphasized cat yes. in that. Well, because it needed to be emphasized, I don't know if you didn't know who she was. Wait. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I know you know who she is. Yes. But yeah, she's technically a cat burglar who they try to wrangle in to kill Batman, obviously, which she does not fall for. No, because it's Catwoman. Hell no, because it's Catwoman, which, by the way, I watched an interview with Michelle Pfeiffer recently, Mm -hmm. and she brought out her whip. She actually had it in her closet. It was one of the most fantastic things I have ever seen. Yes, I just that's that, amazing. That. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, what spy character do you like to dress up See, as, Samantha? You know, I don't dress up as much, so I mm-hmm. really don't have a character that I would dress up as. But like, I think my favorite spy is something along the lines of like, you know, yeah, Black Widow, probably one of my favorites. We're playing a game right now, yeah, the pandemic game. <laughs> surprisingly mm-hmm. enough, and the season zero goes back to the Cold War. So mm-hmm. having all of that instead of being like just diseases, they're spies. Yeah, I we love those pictures of our like terrible disguises oh, we create. Oh my gosh, <laughs> we did this wrong. At one point, we uh, really <laughs> failed. Our, my partner who plays with us as well was like, "They're supposed to be the same person. You can't disguise into different races <laughs> during the Cold War." And I was like. Oh, yeah, that makes we really, sense. We really messed up on yeah, that front. We, we kind of messed up on that one, but it made it more interesting. I will say, I feel like they purposely made our people look goofy because the forehead is way too high for some of those hairdos. Yeah, and I put the hat like not on the head, <laughs> but on top of the head. It's so, like, yeah, I think it would be a good assumption to think that we're not good spies already. <laughs> No. And actually, I was thinking about this because this was Samantha's suggestion, and we've both been very excited to talk about women in the world of assassins and spies for a while. And I know I've mentioned before on the show that I actually went to college thinking I would be working for the CIA or a diplomat. I really wanted to be a diplomat. But as we talk through this, and as I've recently, for this episode, watched a lot of spy and assassin thrillers, I would have been terrible. Mm -hmm. I would have been absolutely terrible. And actually, it kind of freaked me out because I I was like, how can you exist in this world where you can trust no one? Right. And also, especially in our modern times, that they can just be like, oh, at 4 p.m. every day, she reads fan fiction and cries for an hour. Like, (laughs) I I don't want to be a part of this. I don't. (laughs) I think you have to be birthed in the uh, Red Room. Your ceremony is in the Red Room. You can't can't exist. Technically, I guess I could have been the perfect spy because I did live in an orphanage. My origins started at an orphanage. Man, I feel like my life turned... Radically different different than what it could have been. But yes, if you've been listening to our show the last couple of years, you know we love badass women. And we decided we needed to talk about some of those badass women who made history in the spy assassin world. Okay, just to put this cab out here, I went historical. So more of the, the spies and assassins think of like World War II and before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in that time period, just to give you that caveat. So we don't have any like the modern cold uh, war spies. Not that that's modern, but, you know, newer-ish. Because there's definitely a lot of controversy on that. There's definitely a lot of like, I found women that were hit women. Like it was pretty intriguing. Like it made me sad because of course, when we talk of loss of life, there's so much to unpack there because, you know, we want to be sensitive to that. But at the same time, to live in that world, as you said, is so fascinating. Like how do you even come to this point? But yes, of course, we had to do it Samantha Annie style, uh, Sam Ann 
if you will. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I gave us a, a what are those? A nickname? Is that a nickname? <laughs> couple name? Uh, uh, was that them? portmanteau? Yeah. So. Oh, a couple name. Yeah, okay. we got a couple couple name right here, and we made it like this our style by talking about both historical figures and fictional. Figures. Yes. So we wanted to add those two, two together. We even added a couple of bonuses in here so that we're not going to go into as deeply as some of the others. So, of course, there are many, many women we can talk about. And we decided to narrow it down to just five plus those bonuses for today's episode. Yes. And I even put that on Annie, told her she could not yes. do more than five. Gave me a limit. Because I knew what was happening. It would be a 10-part episode about all of our favorite characters, and we would never leave. I did try leave. to push the rules. She sure so. did. She sure <laughs> did by saying there were, quote, bonuses or, you know, yes. shout-outs. Yeah. Uh, but if you want us to dig into more, or even have a request for specific women, uh, you know, we're always down to do a part two. Just let us know. We just yes. don't want to drag out things that you're like, uh, what? Yes. And if any of these women you want us to dig more into, especially... Well, I can't speak for Samantha, but in my fictional women world, I did kind of do baseline superficial right. facts. So if you want us to go in more detail, right. we are happy to. And yeah, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take turns, Annie and I. So I'm going to yes. start out with my historical people, which by the way, if there were spies and there were actually good spies, the likelihood of them not having a lot of information is high. <laughs> just yep. to put that out there. Uh -huh. So I may not have as much information as you do because you have character development as where <laughs> yeah. these historical figures do not want their characters to be known. But of course, there are some that have been celebrated because they were war heroes. So that is something to be said. And yeah, and of course, just to put this, and I think this also applies to the fictional characters, one of the reasons me talk about why there's such a fascination with female and women spies and assassins is because of the fact that, that they are unassumingly out there. People don't assume that they would be harsh, mean killers and or right. spy intellects, like any of those things. And so they just are either the mother, the sister, or the prostitute, which has been uh, used throughout, apparently not only in the mm -hmm. fictional world, but in the real world. Yeah. So just have that pushed out there as well. Right, Any <laughs> Anything else I'm forgetting? Yeah, yeah. Just going along with that, especially when we talk about the fictional characters, if you all remember the episode we did on what is and what should be, this is kind of one of the things I had in mind of we're going to talk about sexpionage and women being coerced into using that or using that because that is the world that we live in and examining kind of the complexity therein of women having to use that and therefore perpetuating this kind of seductress stereotype that that's where women's power is. But there is power there and that's where it gets really messy. Right. But yeah, that's going to come up a lot in this in this story of all these women. And as in fact, that is a great segue in our first historical figure, who was known as Matahari. Margarita Gertrude Zella, born in the Netherlands in 1876, was a pretty big and well-known spy. There's been movies made of her. Uh, Greta Garbo portrayed her uh, later on. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty big. She married pretty young to an abusive military officer. She was trying to get away from her home, which uh, was not so great. So at a young age, at 18, she married this abusive military officer. After the marriage deteriorated, one of her children had been poisoned, apparently, for reasons unknown. And then when she and her husband split, he took the child after giving, like, gossipy news to the world to make her look really bad. Yeah, it was weird. The whole thing was odd. He took the other child and left. And so she was on her own and she moved to Paris to become a mistress to a French diplomat. So she, she you know, made it however she could. Uh, but soon after, she became a dancer. And just so you know, when we talk about her and when we see uh, descriptors of her, they talk about how she was dark-haired, uh, black-blue hair with uh, dark complexion, olive complexion. So even though she was born in the Netherlands, they attributed exotic features to her, as we would say. Mm -hmm. um, and she became pretty famous for her exotic performances, which she created by taking from different cultural and religious practices and symbolism she had learned in the Indies, where she 
she had lived with her first husband. She became known as an exotic dancer of the East and was renamed as Matahara, which meant Eye of the Day. And of course, there's also the story that another man actually put her on this pathway and and told her, you know, this should be your name. Thus, there's a little conflict of who said what and who started what. Mm. Unfortunately, as she became older, her popularity waned, and she soon supplemented her income by, quote, seducing men. Of course, I'm saying this nicely, in the government and military. And because she was a Holland citizen, she was able to travel wherever. She had a neutral citizenship. She was not involved in the wartime stuff. Mm -hmm. And she was able to travel abroad. And here is where we begin to talk about her entry in becoming a spy. Although famous, she was not necessarily the best of spies. Um, and there <laughs> seems to be a lot of different stories about whether or not it was her fault or wh- whether she was completely set up. And because she was willing to travel from man to man, from area to area, they thought she was a good candidate to get information that she they needed during that time, during the war. And she tried to work her way into the German commands. Like She was trying to work for the French and try to get these conversations and information um, and try to get some secrets. But she was soon accused of being a double agent. After some intercepted communications, it seemed to state that Matahari was a spy for Germany as well. Uh, But some say it was a setup by both the Germans in order to have the French arrest her after they realized, oh, she's trying to be a spy. But also possibly from the man who originally helped her become a spy. So that's a whole different story. It was later discovered that she had taken 20,000 francs from a German diplomat in exchange for information. However, she stated, because she did go on trial for this, that she never had any intent to actually spy and give information to the Germans, but was getting compensation for the items that had been taken from her by German guards at one point in time. So she was just trying to, you know, take her money back, essentially. Right. And no one really seems to know Matahari's actual role outside of trying to be a spy, whether or not she was a double agent or just an unsuccessful one for the French. And like I said, many say that she had been set up by Captain Georges Ledoux, who actually, again, started her on the journey. He was the one that fed into this idea. Oh, you have access? Let's get some information. And mm-hmm. when questioned, he stated he had only hired her to root her out as a German spy. So he was saying from the very jump, he thought she was a spy though there was no indication of this. Uh, Later, when different messages were intercepted that contained the statements to incriminate Matahara, it was Ledoux who translated these messages, at which time the originals disappeared. And the only thing they had for evidence was a translated version that he had obtained or he had translated. Uh. And that was it. And by the way, Ledoux was actually accused of being a double agent himself, and I believe he was actually incarcerated for it too. So, hello. (laughs) And after being under harsh interrogations and being represented by an elderly lawyer who apparently was a lover of hers at one point in time, who had never tried a military case, Matahara was convicted within like 45 minutes after the trial and executed a few days later by firing squad. Unsurprisingly, it wasn't just the concerns and misleading information that led her to this conviction, but her lifestyle as well. So they used her because she had that type of excess through all her relationships, but that also was part of her downfall. And they used that morality against her to get her convicted as a double agent. And the prosecutor stated during her trial, quote, without scruples accustomed to make use of men, she is a type of woman who was born to be a spy. And she proclaimed her innocence until the end. Apparently the last two a uh, couple of days, she had a dance party uh, with the nuns. Not dance party, but she had a dance off <laughs> with the nuns who actually were watching her because she didn't want to be remembered as someone who is a prisoner and who has been dejected, but going out in her, like, joy right. and dance and what she was known for originally. Um, and she said during her trial, a courtesan, I admit, a spy, never. I have always lived for love and pleasure. So she was trying to let them know she never did it. And again, like I said, there's a lot of conversation of who was at fault and who did what. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, that kind of stuff annoys me because we'll never know and I want to know. Right? But we can't because that information, that dude, whew, he was going after her pretty hard. See, Ledoux. this is what I've learned about the spy and assassin world. <laughs> no friends. <laughs> so now let's talk about fictional assassins for my first entry. But here's a brief intro. So typically women 
and leather corsets that are, are very monotone and flat. That's what's been the representation of these fictional assassins. But a lot of new assassins in pop culture are challenging that, or at the very least, occasionally subverting it. And researching these characters, there are, are a lot of similar elements I found. Dark past, trauma, chameleons, weird traumatic training, beautiful and willing to use that beauty as a weapon, top-notch wardrobe. It's very stylish. Uh, languages, knowing a lot of languages. Often using people's lowered expectations of them because they're women and girls, like you said, Samantha. Trust issues. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> manipulation. Good liars. Good at reading people. Smart, cunning, thinking quickly on their feet. There are many times where I'm like, how did you realize this in the space of one second? This is impossible. Um, <laughs> very much a lot of betrayal. But also realizing who can still be of use to you. So just because someone betrays you, you might still work with them. Because right. that's just the world you live in, right. right? A lot of Russians on this list. Seems like no one wants to actually be an assassin on this list. <laughs> <laughs> sort of started in childhood and were manipulated into it. So I did choose five popular female assassins in media with an honorable mention and bonuses because I'm the worst and you can't control me, Samantha. But I did, though. I did. I did keep them brief. I did. I did. Um, and all of them could be their own episodes, as we said. I also tried to get a good sampling. And we're not going to talk about the bride from Quentin Tarantino, Uma Thurman's iconic character, because we did talk about her in our Women in Revenge episode, although she is definitely like up there when you're talking about women in the That whole squad. Oh, yeah. Pretty much anybody in that movie, any woman in that movie. But we're going to start with Villanelle, because pretty much every list mentions Villanelle from the BBC show Killing Eve, which it's really funny. This show, this recording of this episode got delayed by like a week. And at the time, I'd never seen this show. But listeners, I have now binge watched it. I have now seen everybody, every movie and show I mentioned for these five women. And I really enjoyed it. Sandra, oh, my girl. My girl. Oh, my girl. it was great. Just saying, keep going. <laughs> so yes, Villanelle is the code name for hired assassin Oksana, played by Jodie Comer. And Phoebe Waller-Bridge is one of the writers. Uh, the show is loosely based on four short novels by Luke Jennings called Codename Villanelle. And Villanelle is brutal and unpredictable, very fashionable, often called a, a sociopath or psychopathy, something going on there. Of the five plus bonus women that I've chosen, she's probably the one who most enjoys being assassin. I guess I should have said spoilers, but spoilers, she that does change. She wants to move up in the world. So <laughs> she is hunted by MI5 security officer Eve Polastri, and they become obsessed with each other. And it's sort of a romantically sexually charged obsession where they like kind of this game of chasing and being chased and also discovering, I guess, your uh, dark... I was similarities, right? Similarities and just human nature, dark side of human nature. And Villanelle really did shake up the female assassin stereotype in pop culture. She, she's funny, she's endearing, she's charming, but she's also deadly and dangerous and frankly, quite terrifying. Her backstory is real messed up, and no surprise there. Uh, she was a violent orphan who castrated a man out of jealousy and then went on to work for the mysterious organization, The Twelve. She really doesn't have too many in the ways of loyalty. There's not too many people, <laughs> if any. I guess you can argue that point there. She's an excellent Marx person. She's very creative in how she kills people, and she speaks multiple languages flawlessly. She's great at reading, like, your weaknesses and your wants and needs. Also. Because you mentioned this recently on a show, Samantha, I almost texted you about this immediately, but I was like, don't do it. It'd be weird. But my superpower with fonts. Yes. Okay. There's an episode where they bring in, like, MI6 brings in this guy who gives a horrible presentation on uh, psychopathy. And it's meant to be horrible. But he uses papyrus font. <laughs> and I laughed aloud because I was like, oh, you know exactly what you're doing. That's a font that's ridiculed throughout the font world. <laughs> There's a whole SNL skit yeah. where Ryan Gosling tries to chase down who used papyrus for Avatar. Why? <laughs> uh, but I laughed aloud. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. yes. It's your superpower. I'm, I'm very impressed. And at the same time, like, don't know if I quite believe you. We're going to have to have a test one day. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> we should do that as an Instagram video where I just test you on your superpower. Oh. Yeah, I I love that show. 
I've only seen through ha- uh, the first season, but it's gut wrenching. And uh, Sandra, oh, again, my girl. Mm-hmm. But we're gonna throw it back now to uh, well, I think she's historical. But let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, we want to talk about the first female ninja, or Kunoichi assassin spy, Machizuki Shiom. Of course, information on her life and her work and her history is a bit foggy, even to the point many debate even if she existed. So we don't mm-hmm. actually know. And again, much like many of the other spies, you don't want much information. And if you know the history of ninjas, they should not exist. You should not actually know who they are. So these right. are soldiers who are supposed to be in the background. So there's a debate. Was she real or was she uh, just kind of a legend? But here is some historical ideas about her. And some of the other theories include that maybe it wasn't just one woman. Maybe it was several women who used this name. Or that oh, like she, James Bond. Yeah, or that she did exist, but the stories and legends were overly exaggerated to make them mm-hmm. legends. Who knows? But what is said about Mochizuki's Chiyom, according to some, Chiyom was a noble woman married to a samurai in the Saku district of Shinano in the 16th century and was a descendant of the ninja Machizuki Izumu no Kami. So she has a lineage, and after the death of her husband during a battle, she was approached by Takeda Shingen of the Takeda clan to become a ninja and to find other women to build a secret group of female ninjas, which she did, and trained these women to collect information, seduce men, and even kill if needed. The women were trained to act as they were needed, whether it was to be a priestess, a maid, or even a prostitute. Disguises and lying to fit a part were a major part of their training. So not only did they get all these ninja skills, but to become whatever woman they needed to be. Right. And from the outside world, this coalition seemed to be just a shelter for young women who were in need of help, whether trying to survive or were orphaned. And many thought Chiyom was a motherly figure trying to shelter these women and give them what they need and care for them, when in actuality, she created this fierce organization of women ninjas, which some say grew up to be th- over 300 women in the organization. They were a force to be reckoned with, and uh, the Takeda clan became very powerful. Of course, the story goes on to talk about how Takeda Shingen was actually killed, and they don't know who killed him. Oh. There's different stories, whether it was actually Chiyom herself or whether Mm -hmm. he was assassinated by the more powerful clans or opposing clans. She eventually disappears in history. And again, there's a lot of rumors to what happened to her and her organization, including maybe she was violently assassinated. So there's, again, more theories. Of course, there are no records to show of them or how it came Mm -hmm. to an end. So this is a big mystery. And it also has been movies. And she's actually shown up as characters in different video games, assassin video games. So it's very interesting to see. But I... She was the reason I wanted to do this episode, Real Talk. <laughs> because I'm like, oh my God, it's a female ninja and we need to talk about her. Again, I don't have a lot of information and there's different people saying different things. And a lot of it are just blog posts and or hopes, sure. especially for those who are fascinated by uh, the Japanese culture and the ninja culture, which is fascinating, let's be real honest, which is why we have so many ninja karate movies throughout. But yeah, have her as possibly a historical figure who ran an all-women's ninja organization. Yeah. <laughs> oh, terrifying. I'm telling you, that's what I've learned through watching these movies and shows. They're like, this is a scary place. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so we did want to talk about the next fictional entry, but first we're going to pause for a quick break for a word from our sponsor. back. Thank you, sponsor. So before uh, we go into the next person on my fictional female assassin spies list, I did want to say there is some debate over the definition of spies and assassin, right? right. And especially assassin in this case, I would say. But, and there are some in the, the shout outs slash bonus list that I actually would not say are assassins, but people included them on their list right. a lot. So... Um, at least in some people's eyes. Yeah, I think I told you uh, it was interesting to go through my list because they confused assassins with just killers. Serial killers, yeah. Serial killers. So I was like, that's not what I would consider assassin because, you know, that has some kind of political leaning typically. Yes. So, Mm -hmm. and, and again, a lot of spies, and we don't talk about too many of them. Well, actually, I guess... 
when we talk about Qiyom, they were taught to kill if necessary. They did poison men and or do what they needed to do. It wasn't a primary focus, but some spies mm-hmm. have killed. So, Right. Yes. So for our next fictional assassin slash spy, we're talking about Arya Stark from Game of Thrones. So, so spoilers, brief spoilers in here, if you haven't caught up. So these are, this show is based, HBO show, based on the G.R.R. Martin books, and Maisie Williams plays Arya Stark, who was this tomboy turned young assassin. After she loses pretty much everything, Arya has to adapt to survive, and she becomes obsessed with getting revenge on those who have wronged her. And she she recites the names of those she plans to kill each night and throughout the day sometimes, although... Her revenge does not always involve killing, worth pointing out. She ends up training in combat, espionage, and assassination. Since she's a young girl, most don't view her as a threat. She's stubborn, impatient, dedicated, independent, resistant to gender roles. But as she ages and trains, she becomes lethal and her impatience wanes. While she is in many ways unforgiving and vengeful, she is more empathetic than many in this very rough Game of Thrones world (laughs) and has more of a sense of justice. When much of her trauma happened, she was a child. So when it's fresh, she is quick to promise murder to any slight, any slight against her family. The first man she kills mocked her recently slaughtered older brother, which, yes, is more than a slight, but (laughs) she stabs him to death with a knife. But with time, this impulsive, vengeful violence lessens, making way for a colder planned revenge. I think that's one thing that separates her from, I think, everyone else on this list. She was a kid, and I would argue that she was, like, traumatized. Oh, definitely. So she kind of went through this assassin phase and then, like, left it. (laughs) Right. But, yeah, because this is set in a fantasy world, she learns how to have no face, meaning she can assume the face of just about anyone. And this is after taking on harsh training under the House of Black and White. And it takes her a minute to let go of her identity of Arya Stark as something important to her, and she never really fully does. Mm -hmm. Uh, She still uses the name. She hides her beloved sword needle uh, when she was supposed to destroy it. She has to learn how to lie, which is kind of a long lesson for her. She admits she is not ready to be no one, uh, but she is ready to become someone else. She's also different than the others on this list because she wants to kill who she wants to kill and is less interested in taking on assignments from a higher power, uh, which gets her into trouble a lot. Through her training, her assassin identity or non-identity consumes her for a while, but when she deems her training as complete, she reclaims her name and returns home. And if you were on her kill list, you were out of luck. You were out of luck. She would kill you after you ate a pie of your own sons. It was just brutal. Uh, <laughs> she, she did end up killing the show's big bad, the Night King. However, yeah, she gives up on her quest for vengeance in the end. She moves out of this assassin phase and decides instead to try to protect and becomes an explorer. However, I still would not mess with her. No way. Yeah. Oh, she definitely had the big <gasps> moments in Game of Thrones, I think. Yeah, and then all the dudes were like, no way she could do it. And yeah, she like, could. Watch her. She did. What about that? <laughs> she did it. What about that? <laughs> well, yeah. I am going to talk about one of the first assassins instead of just a spy here, Charlotte Corday, who was also known as the Angel of Assassination. And Charlotte Corday was a noblewoman in Normandy who, during the French Revolution, was part of the Girondin Conservative Party and worked her way into the presence of Jean-Paul Marat, who was a radical Montagnard. Uh, So he was pretty big uh, during this time, and he was the editor of the Laimi du Poupla, uh, which is translate the friend of the people. And it was a newspaper during that time. And it was also the author of Affront à la Patrie, or Offering to Our Country. So obviously, he was a big part of the movement and changing in the radical party. She, however, under the pretense that she was trying to come and give him some information, was able to see Moral. And while he was taking one of his medicinal baths, apparently he had a condition which he needed to be bathed often, uh, she proceeded to stab him to death which, by the way, is depicted in a really famous Jacques-Louis David painting, The Death of Marat. I think if you saw this painting, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I definitely know this one. It's the dude that's hanging out in the bathtub with a newspaper in his hand. Really Mm -hmm. gorgeous painting. Of course, four days after... (laughs) It really is. Four days after the assassination, Corday was executed for a crime. But she became famous because she was unexpected. It's kind of one of those exactly what you sit there that, wow, she did that. Where she came in and 
felt like her country was being threatened by this man. And apparently he was known to be cruel during that point in Mm. time. And so she went after him. And because no one assumed this frail young woman could do anything, she got to him and was able... She was the Arya who ended up dying, to be fair, and not trained per se, but was able to pull off something that no one else could at that point in time. Yeah, yeah. Well, now for our next fictional entry. And I love the idea that someone kind of dozed off in the beginning and they wake up and they're like, wait, <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? We're going to talk about Black Widow. There we go. Yes. So disclaimer is always with these comic book characters. There are so many multiverses. And if for those keeping up with current Marvel stuff, you know what I'm talking about. It can get real messy. So we're going to be focusing primarily on the films here. So Natasha Romanoff, a.k.a. Black Widow, played by Scarlett Johansson, I mean, she, like, holds her own with the Avengers, goes against, quote, gods and monsters without powers. So, yeah. She was a founding member after she was recruited by Clint Barton, a.k.a. Hawkeye. She said, I have a very specific skill set. I didn't care who I used it for or on. I got on S.H.I.E.L.D.'s radar in a bad way. She was trained from a very young age as a KGB assassin, also was one time a dancer. That's a recurring theme on this list, too. And even after she joined S.H.I.E.L.D. and the Avengers, she still utilized her spy, stealth, and infiltration skills, as well as her combat and weapons training. You can go look, because of course someone's compiled all the training she has, and it's pages and pages long. She also uses her weapon Widow's Bite, which is that glowing blue electroshock thingy Mm -hmm. around her wrist, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a grappling hook, a taser disc shooter, a charger for expandable batons. I was going to say, those things like that are why I could not be a spy, because I would have gotten myself. Like, I just oh, know I would have, like, yeah, it would have been over. Like, the minute I looked at it, kind of like the meme with Luke looking into his lightsaber, that would yes. be that moment of me, like, tasing myself. Because I'm like, cool. Keep you going. know, it's so funny you mentioned that because uh, Google knows me so well, but it's embarrassing. This morning, they were like, Mark Cable says what meme makes him cringe. And I was like, I know which one it is. It's the <laughs> lightsaber. And it was. <laughs> which is not in the movie. You're right. But all right. Yeah, this thing also has, like, strangling wire. It's it's very multifunctional. She was trained in the Red Room, as you said, where the graduation ceremony involved sterilization. Quote, one less thing to worry about makes everything easier, even killing. She was top of her class, though she struggled after she was forced to kill an innocent man. She is definitely sexualized and often weaponizes her femininity. And the fact that people think she is a woman who can't possibly be that strong, she weaponizes that too. Um, She's pretty manipulative. She's good at lying and reading people. She is interrogating people who believe they are interrogating her when we first see her in The Avengers. She tricks Loki to find out his motive in that movie too. She's intelligent, good with technology, good at playing roles, pretty sarcastic. She first appeared in the movies in Iron Man 2 when she goes undercover to spy on Tony Stark, which I thought was a very convoluted plotline, but whatever. Uh, She later helped recruit Tony Stark and Bruce Banner to join the Avengers in the first Avengers movie, partly motivated by her determination to save Hawkeye from Loki's control, which she eventually does. And she's the one that figures out how to close the portal to stop the aliens that are attacking from New York. I love explaining plots of these movies because they sound so weird when they're like out of context. (laughs) In many ways, she does become the heart of the Avengers. She calls them her family. She helps train the second generation of members. She leads the Avengers post-snap and sacrifices herself so that their mission has a chance of succeeding. She is empathetic and understanding. She doesn't give up on people. She's sort of a reformed assassin is what I'm trying to say, I think. Yeah. Because when I was reading through this, I'm like, she at one time was, but when we see her... That, that's sort of a past life. And she still uses those skills, but not really her thing. Right. Oh, that's just why I'm excited about the Black Widow movie. Which I just realized has still not come out. No. Oh, jeez. No. Yeah. Uh, Sminty watch party. Yeah, she's trying to make amends for her past. And that's why the discovery that S.H.I.E.L.D. has been infiltrated by Hydra and the Winter Soldier hits her so hard because she realized she didn't know whose lies she was telling. Also a common theme in these spy stories. She blows all of her covers at the end and then goes off the grid. And then you see her working through this during Civil War, first siding with Tony Stark over the Sokovia Accords, but then helping her friend Captain America, forcing her to once again go off the grid and go on the run with Captain America. Post-snap or the blip, she's determined to keep fighting to make things better. And I do want to put asterisks here. I feel like 
maybe fictional women around the world, I will return to this because a lot of you are probably being like, well, there's a lot of feminist issues you could unpack here about like the serialization thing, the sexualization thing, the fact that she's the one that sacrifices. It's like not many women to go around. (laughs) But yes, we're going to put a pin in that for now and uh, move on. Right. I will say I do love her relationship with uh, Captain America, Steve Rogers, that it's platonic. I do too. And it remains that way. I'm like, yeah, finally. My God. Me too. Although they at the beginning, it did seem like they were trying to... Yeah. Well, I think they were pretty much with anybody with her. Like, <laughs> at that point, that's true. Maybe this will work. Maybe this will work. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to go and take it back uh, to the Civil War. Oh, yeah, I did that. Okay. So we have a Canadian woman, uh, Sarah Emma Edmonds, who escaped an abusive home and, a, and actually an arranged marriage, left and changed her name from Edmonds to Edmonds' son. And she eventually made her way into the United States around 1858. Well, she decided to disguise herself as a man so she could travel across the country and secure a job. She called herself Franklin Thomas and soon worked as a very successful traveling Bible salesman. Yeah. Wow. As the Civil War began in the States, she decided to enlist as Franklin Thomas to assist in the war. On the Union side, by the way. She nursed wounded soldiers in the hospital and worked as an attendant for them for a while, but was moved to becoming a mail carrier during that time for the Union. So she would actually travel in these really dangerous conditions to carry mail. (laughs) She eventually was asked to be a spy and was sent to get information behind enemy lines the Confederacy. Uh, She often disguised herself as a woman. So she was a woman pretending to be a man, pretending to be a woman which I thought was awesome, or (laughs) sometimes as an Irish peddler. Uh, Of course, not much of this information was found on record since she was supposed to be a spy, but was part of her own retelling in her memoir, Nurse and Spy in the Union Army. She kept seeing some battle time and even getting injured while trying to carry mail, but eventually left after being denied furlough when she contracted malaria and she was afraid of being discovered as a woman if she sought medical attention. And so Franklin Thomas left and was charged with desertion. So she released her memoirs in 1864 and gave it pretty much a, a tell-all with some fictional takes on some of the events. So I guess she was kind of embellished. Sure. But she gave all the profits she made to different soldiers' aid groups. So it wasn't about her. Um, and she actually went to her infantry reunion in 1876 and was received with open arms and was eventually recognized by the military and cleared of desertion charges, as well as given a pension. So she had the backing of her soldiers, which I believe was the second uh, Michigan battalion, that she was able to get her pension, which, by the way, apparently literally took an act of Congress in 1884 for her to receive. But after her death, she was buried with military honors at Washington Cemetery in Houston. And a year before her death, she was admitted to the Grand Army of the Republic, which made her the one and only female member, which I thought was super cool. So... We've talked about uh, different other soldiers. Right. And she was another one. To be fair, she was a white Canadian woman. So there's a little difference in her story. But she was able to get pension and she was able to get recognition for her work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hard pivot from the Civil War. I know. Our next fictional character is Hannah, which I just watched last night. And I've been meaning to watch this for a while because people kept saying this is a movie you'd really like. And I'm like, I'm not sure. (laughs) But I did like it. Uh, So this is a film by Joe Wright where Shorsha Ronan plays 16-year-old Hannah Heller who was raised from a young age to be an assassin, trained in the Finnish wilderness by her father who was a former black ops officer. The CIA enhanced her DNA to give her exceptional strength as part of a program to create super soldiers her father ran away with her and now they're kind of both on this list of, you know, must kill. Uh, she, and she is very deadly. She has weapons training. She can speak multiple languages. Her her father's very precise in the training of her, like never lets her sleep without attacking her and always questioning her to answer in these different languages. So while on a mission across Europe handed to her by her father... She is hunted by Marissa Weigler, who's played by Kate Blanchett. (laughs) Uh, She's an intelligent officer that actually Hannah thought she'd killed. That was her mission was to kill her, but it was a ploy. 
So she killed the wrong woman. She killed a woman dressed like her. <laughs> and there is an Amazon Prime show based on the movie with Esma Creed Mile as Hannah. Because of how Hannah was raised so isolated, she is quite curious about the outside world. Like, she's never heard music. She doesn't know what dancing is, those kinds of things. But also, she's very, very paranoid, which makes sense. It's an assassin coming-of-age story. Okay, so I do know. I didn't. I haven't watched it. But I've seen the previews for the Hannah Amazon Prime show. And I was like, yes. wait, I, I know this. I didn't, I haven't watched either one of those. Yeah, but I do think it's interesting, like the fact that uh, Amazon Prime took this and made it a series. They did the same thing, not necessarily with Black Widow, but with S.H.I.E.L.D. and made it a spy show yep. on its own. So I do find mm-hmm. that interesting too, because it is. It's a very big story that you could take in big rabbit holes. Like you, like th- oh, yeah. jumps that you don't realize is going to happen. Yes, absolutely you can. And we probably have more twists and turns in this episode. But first, we have one more quick break for a word from our sponsor. And we're back. Thank you, sponsor. Twists and turns, yes, because I am now going to take it back to World War II. Okay. So we're coming, because Hannah was kind of like, today, what if she's a spy? Yes. And I'm going to talk about Noor Inayat Khan, who was born to an American mother, an Indian father in Moscow in 1914. And she was a direct descendant of 18th century Muslim ruler of Mysore, Tipu Sultan. Her father was a musician and a Sufi teacher and moved the family to London and eventually to Paris, where Khan was able to get her education and eventually become a children's writer. After the fall of Paris in 1940, she actually escaped to London where she joined the WAAF or Women's Auxiliary Air Force. It was said her father had instilled in her the desire for nonviolence and the unity of all religions, which is what Sufi was, and that she had learned from an early age to stand up for those who were oppressed and was willing to sacrifice to do so. So that though she was not a British citizen, she wanted to work and help in this fight. Soon after she joined the WAAF, Khan was recruited to join the Special Operations Executive, or SOE, which was a secret British organization that sent spies in occupied areas of Europe. So with Khan's education and her ability to speak French fluently, this was perfect for her. So she, again, she knew different languages and was able to fit in. Uh She became the first woman wireless operator sent by the UK. And she actually went into France and worked with Prosper, which was a French resistance network. But when she first arrived, all of her high-ranking agents were captured as well as their equipment by the Nazis, leaving Khan as the only operator for the next few months. Unfortunately, she was eventually arrested by the Gestapo or the Nazi secret police after one of her colleagues betrayed her. So you have all of these like twists and turns. And there is a movie out, by the way. That was released last year, I believe. Um, And she was tortured and placed in isolation by the Nazis for information, but she never gave any information and was eventually executed. And as in fact, one of the people who questioned her talked about how impressed he was of her because she was so brave and so steady. So... I thought that was really, really interesting. In August of 2020, Noor became the first South Asian woman to be given the blue plaque. And there's possible talks of her being on a British coin as well, which would be super cool. Wow. (laughs) She was also awarded the George Cross and the French de Guerre after her death. And a statue was also unveiled in 2012 in London honoring what she did for the war. So she is a big figure. And also there's this big conversation of the fact that at that time, she was a follower of Mahatma Gandhi and even said, you know, after the war, she would have to side with India over Britain, even though she had fought for right. and, and, and was, you know, in service of Britain, but because where her heart lies. And again, she was about representing for those who are oppressed. And she saw this community as being oppressed, and she was absolutely right. But it was really interesting, the fact that she's finally being recognized and giving all the accolades that she should be given, and just being and seeing what she had done, and that she had died in service for a country that wasn't technically hers. Right. Well, that's an interesting segue into my next fictional pick, which is Red Sparrow. Mm-hmm. And I chose this one very specifically because it does include a, the heavy element of sex espionage. Which I think we could come back and do a whole episode on because the school that they mention in this book slash movie that uh, Red Sparrow goes to may or may not be real. It might actually be a thing that people went to and learned to basically have sex and have no attachments. So 
It's a book by Jason Matthews that's set in modern-day Russia, which had a movie that came out recently in which the, the titular character was played by Jennifer Lawrence. I also watched this again last night, and I will tell you, it is tough. That was a tough watch. I enjoyed it, but all right. So after famous ballerina Dominika Egorova suffers an injury that ends her dancing career, which was gruesome and on purpose, she is coerced into joining Russia's Foreign Intelligence Service, the SVR, in order to support her ailing mother. She is trained as a sparrow, which is, yes, someone who uses their body in seduction as a weapon, also called sexpionage, and given the code name Diva. The world she operates in is brutal. Uh, there's torture and there's rape and there's no room for failure. And even if you don't fail, they'll probably torture you. And there's so much backstabbing. You really can't trust anybody. <laughs> and uh, the training for these pharaohs involves stripping naked and performing sex acts on strangers in front of other strangers, detaching from their bodies, these lessons that are taught by the unforgiving matron. And uh, Dominica's main weapon is as, quote, an anomalous sex object, even though this obviously limits her and her capabilities, which some have interpreted as a direct criticism of the depiction of women in this genre, like the movie and book were directly criticizing those things. But in the end, she is the one who gets revenge. It's pretty satisfying uh, playing those that thought they were playing her. When I was watching this, though, it was another one of those things where I was like, damn, she's smart. <laughs> I would have just been like, oh, I'm screwed. <laughs> um, she figures these things out on the fly and she was really good at reading people. That was kind of her whole thing but she could immediately f figure out that puzzle piece of wants and needs that people had and fit into it. From David Sims at The Atlantic, this is a secret agent story in which the secret agent angrily complains that she got sent to horror school by her government, one that tries to flesh out the undercurrent of misogynistic coercion inherent in so many of these narratives. Yeah, kind of reminds me of the storyline with The Americans, and I only watched a couple of episodes, uh, which has Carrie Russell right. and her now husband, yeah. but they are Russian spies that are sent into the U.S., but they mm -hmm. have a small scene where she is being trained and she gets brutally raped by a, a teacher. Uh, but it's being taught, this is what you have to deal with. This is what you're going to have to learn. So right. you need to learn here. So it's kind of like, oh, what's happening? Yeah. But yeah, I think, and it was so funny, is as I was researching it, Red Sparrow did come up and a lot of different lists of people came into this. And we, when we talk about the more modern spies, you see that a little more mentioned. Now, not necessarily that it wasn't done because when we talk about the female ninjas, and one of the things they talked about was being geishas and prostitutes and being sent out, as well as priestess, mm -hmm. to be uh, prostitutes and, you know, in their presence to get that information. However, you know, you need to. They don't expect a prostitute to be a spy necessarily, which we know is a plot line for a lot of the movies because partially it is true. Yeah. And a lot of the old school spies, whether we're talking about the KGB, because I saw KGB references, which again, you're not supposed mm -hmm. to know much about, but a lot yeah. of them had like details of being dancers or, or hookers or mm -hmm. all of these things that you see. It happened a lot more than we know and or that's the part we know about them because that was the public persona. Right. So there's that. Right. Yeah, so that is kind of the conclusion. I do have a little bit of bonus and just kind of some mentions, uh, just to name a few more historical spies that we could dig into later. Christine Grantville, who was Britain's first female special agent. Belle Boyd, a.k.a. La Rebelle. Ooh. Yes, a spy for the Confederacy during the Civil War in the U.S. Uh, and then Josephine Baker, which I know people have know, know that name, who was an American-born French dancer, entertainer, was also a French resistance spy. Yeah, so there's plenty. Yeah, there were plenty so many that I was like, okay, who am I going to focus on? Yeah, it was hard to choose, which is why I also have a bonus mention and then some shout-outs. Of course. Uh, <laughs> And I know you had to. You had to. I know you did. I had to. And you know I had to include the Star Wars one, <laughs> which is Mara Jade. And actually, I bet she's going to show up in canon soon, like official Disney canon. So oh, okay. this is giving you a little heads up. <laughs> so in, in the Star Wars Extended Universe slash Legends, um, which is no longer canon, but before Disney came along, this is what was up. She was a secret assassin raised and trained by the emperor himself. She became so deadly that she earned the title The Emperor's Hand. And she hears this prophecy in her head that she will kill Luke Skywalker. So, of course, she hunts him down. And then she finds him and catches him and they fall in love. And she's like, oh, no, I can't kill him, but I must. But twist, the evil wizard who is now in power. <laughs> 
has used Luke's cut-off hand to clone Luke and make an evil Luke with two you, Skywalker. So she kills Luke and marries Luke and becomes a Jedi. Uh, and this double U plot twist is one of my very favorite things ever. Yes, I laugh and laugh it. and laugh. Yes, I, I love it. And I am definitely <laughs> laughing. Um, and then bonus, just to, I know that they exist. There's Mrs. Smith, the bride, which we said, pretty much anyone in Kill Bill. Alias, Mayday and A View to Kill. Salt, Nikita, Aeon Flux, Elizabeth Jennings from The Americans. Yep. Samantha Kane, played by Gina Davis from The Long Kiss Goodnight, which I forgot about. Yeah. But that was a good throwback. Taraji P. Henson's Mary Goodwin and Proud Mary. Yeah. She released Theron and Atomic Blonde and a bunch of other things. Yeah. She's an assassin a lot. She's an assassin a lot. Yeah, she she's a is. Bad, so is I feel like she could do it well. Her and Angelina yeah. Jolie, I feel like they actually yeah. could do it. Except yes. for the fact that they're famous now. Oh God. But like, just being <laughs> badasses in general. Yes. And then there's Death Strike Electra. I say that with a lilt because I think I would argue whether or not she's an assassin depending on which piece of fiction you're reading. But anyway, Lucy, Anna, Ava, and then Genesis, which I just wanted to throw in there, is the favorite character I've ever written. And she is weirdly an assassin slash spy but I love her and she's a hot mess <laughs> and terrifying. <laughs> I feel like all of them are kind of hot messes. Yeah, so kind of just like, why are these lives so fascinating? Well, we've looked at the many movies and characters that represent the world and it's obvious we can't get enough. They keep coming. I'm I'm eagerly waiting for Black Widow. Like, I'm so excited for it. Um, and yeah. the one thing we saw throughout our research was that many believe because women are seen as mild-mannered and often either sexually or motherly. Therefore, there couldn't be any possible threat from them, right? They're not real threats, yeah. which makes them even more effective. Yeah. That was one of my favorite slash most annoying things watching Red Sparrow last night. It was how many times they were like, oh, you're a sparrow. You can do like these really sexual things, right? But you're only doing it for your spy thing, right? And then she does it and they like fall for it. And I'm like, but you just <laughs> said, you know what she is, and then she did it. <laughs> and you're the dumb ones to fall for it. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Please, listeners, let us know if we miss anybody, if you want us to go into more detail on any of these characters or historical or fiction. Either way, we would love to hear from you. Our email is stephaniamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Instagram at Stuff Mom Never Told You or on Twitter at Momstuff Podcast. Thanks as always to our super producer, Christina. Thank you, Christina. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I've Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 